Hello, everyone, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and oh, my goodness gracious, Murgatroyd, I am telling you, this show is the show. If you've missed the show, you've, if you've missed any show, you do not want to miss this one. I am telling you right now, this show is absolutely outstanding. Let me give you a hint who I got, okay? So she's got this $150 million company, all right? She does this extraordinarily unbelievable sugar-free tasting water, seltzer water, uh, sanitizer, sunscreen. You have enough hints? Okay, I'll just tell you. It's Kara Golden. She is, she is the author of this book, Undaunted. She is the CEO and founder of Hint. <laughs> See what I did there? I knew you would love it. Listen, she is going to be absolutely outstanding. The book is phenomenally incredible. You're going to love her. I've had a chance to already talk with her. Oh my gosh. She is absolutely fantastic and she's going to be great, but we're going to do what we do every week. And you know what that is, right? We're going to check in to see how your training is going in the four areas of your life. Here's the deal, right? So, you know, what we've learned in our journey here is that, especially talking to special operations forces, people that have been on the show, is that when we're under stress, we're under pressure, when we're under fire, when we're tired, when we're hungry, we never rise to the occasion. We only fall back to the level of our training, which is why it's so important for us to train every single day in those four areas of your life, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So I want to check in with you and let's see how you're doing out there all over this great world and find out how your training's doing this past week. So we do this on a scale of one to 10, one being my training's not very good, 10 being, wow, my training couldn't get any better. Okay, so physically, let's just start there. How have you been doing in terms of getting enough exercise? How have you been doing in terms of eating right, drinking enough water, right? Getting enough sleep, right? If you were to evaluate yourself in those four areas, what, would, what number would you give you on that scale of one to 10? Right, and then the question is, regardless of what that number is, it's okay, right? What I want, I don't want you to go, if you're a three, okay, it's a three, right? I'm not trying to get you to a 10 right away. What I want you to do is what can you do right now? What can you change right now to get from a three to a four or a three to a 3.5? That's what's really important here, okay? So there's your first number, your physical number. Your second number, the mental number. What do I mean by mental? What are you doing to take charge of what you're putting into your mind and growing yourself? You know, Kara talks about she loves to make sure that she reads 30 minutes every day. I think it's really awesome. She also talks about that she was a Wall Street Journal um, addict, and she still is, right? And she also talked about how she started to get into Fortune Magazine, and somebody introduced that to her along the way, and she became a Fortune Magazine addict. And, you know, she even tells the story that when, you know, Warren Buffett first started, he'd read like between 500 and 1,000 pages a day. Um, you know, I read a book a week for the show. What are you doing to grow yourself mentally? And remember, you have two halves of the brain, right? As a psychological professional, one of the things I remind people is don't get caught just exercising one half of your brain, right? You got a creative side, which is your right side. You got a more logical side, which is left side. Reading a book is a great way to exercise both of those things, especially if you're playing it, but there's other ways to do it. So on a scale of one to 10, how would you say you're doing in your mental growth? Right? All right, so you got two numbers, right? Third number, emotional. Your emotional training. By the way, we've been in emotional training for a year and a half. Every day, it's called a pandemic. Every day we're under emotion. It's, it's emotional stress for all of us on some level, right? Because we're not used to having to wear masks and we're not used to having to you know, not do the things that we normally do. I miss going to concerts, right? Love music and miss doing that. And so we're not doing the things that we normally do. So we're, oh, we're constantly under pressure there. But you know what, we're, we're also under pressure in our daily lives. People have expectations of us. People want things from us. And we have to give of ourselves emotionally. So the first part of your emotional training is how well are you able to control your emotions when you're under stress? Right? Somebody cuts you off in the traffic. You know, you can control your emotions. Somebody kicks you in the shin. I used to tell my psychology class, you know what, you can kick me as hard as you want in the shin. I still have a choice how I'm going to respond to you. Didn't say it was always easy but you do have that choice. And then the second part of the emotional training is how well are you able to tap into and understand the emotions of others? You know, so often what we do is we think we're listening, but we're really not because we're really not tapping into understanding what other people's emotions are. 
And sometimes that requires us to have a bigger emotional vocabulary. It requires us to really understand where they're coming from. It is a combination of empathy and sympathy, I think. It's a combination of not only putting yourself in that person's shoes, but feeling what they feel. A scale one to 10, how well would you say you're doing that? All right, then finally, the fourth area, the spiritual area, right? A lot of people say, well, Jay, you know, I'm not real spiritual. I don't believe in God. And right, you know what? We all have faith. You have faith in something. You know, my wife, who's probably one of the smartest human beings on the planet, and she did not pay me to say that, has said to me on more than one occasion, she has said to me, you know, whenever we're under stress and under pressure and we're feeling down, the first place we run to is probably the God we worship. It's our idol. And that's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it because we all run to something when we, when we don't feel good. Maybe we get comforted by food. We put faith in food or, you know, or those of us who used to drink a lot of diet drinks, right? You know, uh, diet Coke, right? Some of us, it's nature. Some of us, it's meditation. Some of us, it is God. We have faith in something. I promise you, you do. Even to not believe in something means that you're believing in something else, right? So how is that working out for you? whatever it is, if it's nature, if it's meditation, if it's God, how's it working out? What do you need to do to change it? How's it going to be better? And what's that, what's that number scale one to 10? So you got four numbers, right? Physical, mental, emotional number. It's like the legs of a chair, the legs of a chair are uneven. You know, if you sit in there long enough, your, your posture is off, right? Same thing is true in all four areas of your life. By the same token, if the legs of your chair are too low, you can't eat at the table and get the nutrition that you really need. So we, what we want to do is we want to bring up all four of those legs at the same time, and we want to have them at the right height. And speaking of someone who does, that's why she's part of the reason why she's on the show. Her name is Kara Golden. Uh, she is a purpose-driven, inspiring entrepreneur. I should not have to go on any further than that, but I will. She's a former AOL executive and the founder of Hint uh, Water and uh, all sorts of other products. And the leading lifestyle brand of naturally flavored water. It is sugar-free, by the way, folks, and it is delicious. Golden uh, Kara created the um, San Francisco-based beverage company as an alternative to soda and sugary beverages. Hint has also recently launched a screen, sunscreen spray that is oxybenzone benzone and paraben-free and scented with fruit essence. You try saying it. I, I, you try saying that, you know, when you're trying to do it quickly. Uh, Kara has been named among Fortune's most powerful women entrepreneurs in Forbes, 40 women to watch over 40. The Huffington Post listed her as one of the six disruptors in business alongside Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. Her latest book, Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, is a Wall Street Journal bestseller and is, uh, just gives you a rare opportunity to gain insights and proven advice. Unlike anything you'll find in the conventional business press, I promise you that is true. Kara combines real, honest stories from her life with observations that might just change how you think about your own. Previously, Kara was Vice President of Shopping and E-Commerce Partners at a Partnerships at AOL, where she helped lead the growth of startup shopping uh, business to a $1 billion enterprise. She's active speaker, writer, and member of the C200 and a member of San Francisco Bay Young Presidents Organization, the world's premier chief executive leadership in organization. In 2016, she launched the Kara Network, a digital resource and mentoring platform for both aspiring and established entrepreneurs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show and welcome to a new direction, Kara Golden. Welcome, Kara. Hello, thank you for the kind intro. You are so welcome. So the book I loved, uh, I, I, I can't say it enough. I just love this book. <laughs> I Thank really do. So much. Um, I, I really do. It's great. And so I want to just start digging into it right away. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that people need to understand about this book is that this is Undaunted is kind of it's a journey. I, I wrote that this is a journey that you've taken. And then along the way, you give us these great pieces of um, entrepreneurial success leadership hints and bites that we can use. And so um, I'm going to just kind of jump in uh, to chapter two, uh, because chapter one, you know, you kind of led us through that your dad, you know, actually invented healthy choice meals, which I thought was incredible. And then kind of, we kind of find out about your work history a little bit. But I thought there was something that you was really interesting. Chapter two is called Create Your Own Opportunities. And um, you, of course, are a graduate of Arizona State University Sun Devils. And so, I, but a lot of people want to think that entrepreneurs are these numbers people. But you say, quote, unquote, in chapter two, I don't have a natural inclination for numbers. 
<laughs> that's kind of, to me, that may be kind of odd. Do you find that not having that natural inclination for numbers was a hindrance or help for you in terms of, you know, becoming an entrepreneur and launching Hint? You know, it's, it's interesting because I frankly was afraid of numbers when I went to college and I ended up having an opportunity to take some classes in finance. I, I think I only took those classes in finance because I had friends in those classes. And, uh, and what I realized was that I, I was kind of purposefully avoiding doing finance because I wasn't great at it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people, that's like a, that is a, people put up walls and try and prevent themselves from looking stupid or, or, you know, getting a bad grade or whatever it is. And so when I finally focused in on finance, I was actually a minor in finance because what I found was I was so challenged by, you know, and, and this, there, this whole world opened up around finance for me. So again, I knew that I didn't want to go into, you know, work on wall street or go and work in an accounting firm, but I, wanted to know and knew that I knew enough about business planning and EBITDA and all of that kind of stuff. But I still to this day say that it's not my favorite area. But I think that, you know, the one thing I would say about entrepreneurs is that there's, there's not just, they're not, not all cut from one cloth, right? There, right. there are different types of entrepreneurs and different skill sets. And so the most important thing is to kind of know what your, what you enjoy, but also what you're really good at. And part of building out a company is not just about an idea. As I always say to entrepreneurs or, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs, ideas are a dime a dozen, right? And the, the key thing is, is your ability to actually build out the right team. And people are everything in a company, right? If you don't have people to support you, then you cannot build successful companies. And I think every single leader will say that. So it, it's, it's a two-part you know, process, but really figuring out, you know, do I, I mean, I've got an incredible finance team on our, in our, inside of our company. It doesn't mean that I don't have to know about it. I mean, I think that that's another thing that entrepreneurs, some, some entrepreneurs do wrong is that they think, oh, I don't need to know about it. I'll just go and hire that's the way you get yourself in trouble, right? If you don't understand every single aspect of your company, that's the way that you really get in trouble as a founder, as a CEO. Right. I, you know, it, it, it is so true because I think what happens is and we'll talk about, you know, sometimes you have to, well, you talk about, you know, building, building the plane while it's in the air. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I, but it's really true because you don't have to have complete clarity on everything in order to launch. And it, sometimes we get frozen and paralyzed there. I think quite often where, you know, we feel like, well, if I don't know this, there's no way I can be successful. But I mean, you've proved all those wrong, right? I mean, because it, it may not have been your favorite thing, but you still launched the idea because you, you yourself had said, and we'll get to it, but you yourself have said that, you know, what you learned, you know, AOL, CNN, and all the other places that you've been, is that you really love the creative process. Yeah, absolutely. And, but I think having a basic understanding of every aspect of the company. So I'll give you another example. I mean, 50% of our business is direct to consumer mm -hmm. and the number of CEOs that I've run into in the food and beverage industry who don't even understand the difference between a direct to consumer business and Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. It's just I frightening. And, and again, it's, it's, it's understanding when you don't actually have the knowledge, then you ask, right? You ask these questions, but people don't want to do that because they look foolish, right? They're, and I think that this happens as we get older, as we move up in organizations, right? We, you know, we want to be the pro. We're used to being the pro, but I actually find learning as this place where every single day I put myself into positions where I am going to learn. So if I don't understand SEO, for example, I'm going to sit there, and not only read, but I'm going to try and do as much research as possible. Or if I am hiring somebody, what I say to my team too, is hire people that know more than you, not just to do the tasks, 
but who know more than you. And the reason is not to work yourself out of a job that may happen, but because you're going to learn and you're going to stay engaged. And so it could be as simple as hiring people who not only know something about, you know, what you're doing and you can mentor and manage and teach them, but, you know, maybe they know a lot about TikTok, right? And you have no idea how to do TikTok, <laughs> right? And you're, and, you know, and you spend time learning from them. I think that that's how you create engagement. I love that. Uh, Kira, I want to, you, you mentioned something just a little bit because you were a constant learning mode. And I want to give you a quote, page eight. Um, it's, that's how far we've gotten in the book so far, page, eight pages. Um, Quote, I've met or interviewed many entrepreneurs and they can all point to a book that has inspired them, comma, changed their lives, comma, or positively affected their companies. Reading and learning for you is a prerequisite, is it not? I mean, it just, that, that to me really came forward. And I think people need to understand from you, and I'd love to have you talk about why learning and reading is just so powerful and important. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the old saying learning is, you know, learning is power, right? I mean, if you actually, and, and, and I think more than anything, it's, it's what satisfies curiosity. I think that the most curious people today are the happiest people, mm. right? And it, because you're constantly, I mean, it, it, is, it is so invigorating to actually learn every single day. And yet again, it stops along the way. It typically, when we, you know, finish going to school, then all of a sudden we're in this position to go and make money. And you can actually do both. You can actually go into life and continue to learn along the way. And yet we don't do that as humans. And part of the reason why I wanted to write this book too, and more people have said, gosh, this is the most authentic book of, you know, coming not only from, you know, an entrepreneur and a founder, but somebody who's still the CEO of my company. I mean, right. this is, you know, I talk a lot about so many different stories along the way where it wasn't always perfect. And there were so many challenges that we had along the way, but today we're the largest privately held non-alcoholic beverage in the country that doesn't have a relationship with Coke, Pepsi, or Dr. Pepper Snapple. And, you know, we didn't start out that way. I didn't start out in the beverage industry either. As you mentioned, I was a tech executive. I mm. didn't have any experience. I thought I needed to hire all these people with experience in order to, you know, be successful. And instead, what I learned was that I was, I had to really look at what I had learned over the years. And what I found was in order to do something different, taking what, you, what you've learned in your journey, taking your challenges are really the most important thing to success, not necessarily experience. You know, and that, that runs right into another quote that you have. It says, you said, if the opportunities I want are not coming to me, I'll create them for myself. Yeah. And that's always been kind of my thinking. And, and uh, you know, I was, People have asked me a lot, like, where did that come from? And, you know, you never really know, right? And I was the last of five kids, grew up in Arizona. And, uh, but I think for me, I was always, I was a little bored. I was always searching out, uh, you know, for the next thing. I was, I, you know, probably always trying to, maybe not intentionally, but it annoyed my parents a lot with all these questions. I would say, well, what about this? What about this? And, you know, I had brothers and sisters who were older than me. So I, in my mind, they had so many other opportunities where life was unfair. I was, you know, slamming the door when, when I, you know, would say, this isn't fair, click, you know, so if that's your kid, that was exactly who I was. And, but it, I think seeking out opportunities, again, I always felt like that was where I was going to learn about things. And I never thought that there was anything wrong with that. Yeah, I, I, I think sometimes though, like, and I, I know you see this because, you know, we both have been around for a while and, but we have found that, you know, a lot of times people will, when they don't get the opportunity, they just quit. Yeah. Right. And they just, yeah. they just quit and they stop. And there's no, there's no success when you quit. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I mean, one of your, the, one of the most, there's a theme in your book that says, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, your dad gave you that, right? I mean, throughout, I mean, from the very beginning of the book, 
all the way to the end, you have this phrase. It says, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? So yeah, you, you might as well try it. Absolutely. I mean, one of the stories I'll share from the book that a, a lot of people have, in, have enjoyed is when I was leaving Arizona, I was waitressing actually when I was in college at a local restaurant. And I, this guy used to always come into the restaurant who uh, it, I didn't know what he did. And one day he asked me the horrible question that all, you know, college, uh, uh, almost college graduates or new college graduates get, what are you going to do? Right. And so I, I said, I'm not sure, but what do you do? And what I say to, when I'm speaking on college campuses, anytime anybody asks you that question, you have a right to ask them the question back. What do you do? They're asking you what you want to do. And you say that, I mean, that's just basic communication, right? So I asked him and he said, I work for Anheuser-Busch and I do product placement. So I'm you know, savvy enough to know that Anheuser-Busch is a beer company. I'm a college student, right? I know what that is. And, <laughs> and so I said, product placement, where do you place product? And he said, on movie sets. Mm. And I said, this is really amazing. Can you get me a job doing that? I was half kidding, but kind of half serious. And he said, I'm happy to introduce you to the right people. And, but it's in Los Angeles. And I said, I could go to Los Angeles. <laughs> and he said, terrific. So he set me up. And anyway, the net of it is, is, since I was going to LA, I told everybody I knew that I was going to Los Angeles. If you know of anybody who wants to hire a terrific new college grad, let me know, because I want to go meet with them, because I wanted to use my time wisely. Net of it is, is that ended up it over the next month to be 90 job interviews, 90, right? And I mean, which was insane. And I ended in the place that was my long shot goal, right? I wanted to go to New York City. I wanted to work in New York at Fortune Magazine. And I had written the then managing director of Fortune Magazine, who, you know, I had read his magazine through uh, all of my college finance classes. And so I wrote Marshall Loeb a letter and I said, I would love to work for you. And I have been following, I read every, I, every page of Fortune magazine cover to cover. And if I could work for you, that would be my dream job. He wrote me this incredibly nice note back that said, if you're ever in the New York area and please let me know. And so I ended my, my one month journey in New York city. And I showed up in the HR office. This of course was before security in the building. And I went in and I said, I'm here. Here's my letter from Marshall Loeb. I would love to meet with him. And the poor person, I can still see her face. The receptionist did not know what to do with me. And she said, do you have a meeting? And I said, well, I have a letter. And so she, she got the head of HR to come out and she said, is there something I can help you with? And I said, I'm here to see Marshall Loeb. And then she broke the news to me that I was not going to get to meet with Marshall Loeb, <laughs> that there wasn't any roles and they don't hire brand new graduates. And I said, is there any other opportunity in the building? Because I'm here from Arizona. I'm flying back tomorrow. I would love to work inside of the time and life building. And she said, you know, there is an executive that's been looking for an assistant. Would you be willing to do that? Yes. And I didn't know whether or not I would be, but I said yes before I said no. And I ended up, that was my first job. I ended up, I never got a job at Fortune Magazine. For the next couple of years, I worked at Time and that was the start of my career. But again, it's a story of find your opportunities. There's so many lessons learned in there. Say yes before you say no. People would say, but did you think that Marshall would actually meet with you? I didn't know. So I had to go find out, right? I mean, what was the worst that was going to happen? What, they were going to kick me out of the building? Doubt it. They would say, no, he can't meet with you. That's fine. Uh, but regardless, I, you know, I think that there's so many opportunities out there where we 
put all of these walls up. We say no before we're allowed to actually try. And I think that that is the lesson that so many people prevent themselves from doing. And it's important. Since I told you she's great, right? Didn't I tell you? <laughs> I told you she was really awesome. The book is called Undaunted. Her name is Kara Golden. And you're listening to her here on A New Direction. Hey, everyone, listen, you know what? I've got two great sponsors on the show, right? Epic Physical Therapy. Uh, people know them worldwide. Uh, professional athletes from all over the world come into Epic Physical Therapy. And here's why. Regardless if you're recovering from an injury, whether you had surgery, whether you're suffering everyday aches and pains, whether you are a professional athlete and you're just not performing at the level that you want to perform at, here's the deal. The elite team at physical, Epic Physical Therapy is going to provide you with a customized treatment plan tailored to your individual needs. Look, with their experience in rehabbing young athletes to elite professional athletes, they really do understand the need to treat the entire body as a functional whole, not just your symptoms or your injury. So when you're ready for your Epic relief, your Epic recovery, your Epic results, don't look any further. Go to Epic Physical Therapy. That's EpicPT.com. That's E P I C pt.com and linda crafted team realtors you know what for th over 35 years they have been at the top of the game in the research triangle park and they help people all over the world how do they do that well linda believes in creating relationships and so she's created relationships with the best professionals all over the world how can she do that well first of all she's independently owned and operated she doesn't belong to a national company she is her own brand and so that gives her the freedom to find the best professionals wherever they are ever in the world and because she can do that, she can make sure that you have an expert that can help you sell your home or buy your home. So when you're ready to sell or buy your home, start with the relationship maker, the relationship maintainer. Start with the one who her customers say, you know what, her customer service is legendary. <laughs> start with Linda Craft of Team Realtors. You can learn more by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on a new direction with uh, Kara Golden, and uh, she has been absolutely outstanding. Yes, I'm singing her praises. That's what I'm doing because that's what we do on the show. Uh, she's she is great, Kara. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here uh, because you know there's so much there's so much we can say. But some of the chapters that we're going to fly by here is chapter three was called "Show Up." Chapter four is "Know Where You Stand," um, which is a fabulous chapter. And I'm going to move ahead, though, here to um, chapter five, uh, which is entitled Know When to Move On. And I want to give you a quote from page 33. You said, money has never been a big motivator for me. It still isn't. Now, what's the point of making money doing something you don't love? I stuck with it, but I knew I was not going to stay at CNN for long. I think this is, an important, this is another one of those little important, subtle things that Kara Golden says that I think is really, really important for people to wrap their minds around. Help them understand this, that little nugget of goodness. Yeah, well, I think that the most important thing is you go out and try things, right? And I was, I mean, it's interesting to think that at the time, CNN was what would be termed today a late stage startup, right? Ted Turner was still running around the offices. I mean, it was it was just crazy. It was not, you know, the size that it was today. And he was splitting his time between Atlanta and New York City. But what I realized was that I was I was coming in there initially because I thought that Ted was, you know, this godlike figure and that it was an interesting brand and it was really, really exciting. But I understood pretty quickly that it was not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do the type of sales and business development that I was ending up working on. And But that didn't mean while I was there that I wasn't going to do a great job. And I think that that's something that I, you know, really, really... It, when eventually when you look back on things and you connect the dots, I think that putting all that you've got into an organization and knowing that you have got a timeline versus actually burning out on the job, right? And knowing that that's something that is, um, that really you can take with you at all times, that you knew it wasn't going to be the place. I not only learned a lot about sales and some of the other things 
that I was taught there, but I also learned about culture. The culture at Time, for example, was very, you know, blue blood and Ivy League versus what I was seeing from Ted Turner, who, you know, very much the, the organization was, you know, very much him. And which I think is so typical inside of, of companies too, where, you know, he's wearing his, his suit and his cowboy boots. I had even growing up in Arizona, I had never seen such thing, but things, but I think that it's just, it really speaks to no experience along the way is a waste of time, right? That's another thing that I say to people. Sometimes people would say to me, oh, I should never have stayed at that job for so long. Right. Instead of actually thinking about what you've done wrong, figure out what the lessons you learned from that and also understand maybe what you'll take with you. I mean, we ended up doing a Super Bowl ad a few years ago that was super last minute. And I think that a lot of the things that I learned from being at CNN actually helped me to negotiate that deal, right? I didn't know it when I was sitting there that we would have, I would eventually be running a company and doing a Super Bowl ad, but I knew enough about trafficking an ad through and waiting until the last minute and people thinking, you know, that it's going to be one price, but it will discount really fast the closer and closer you get to the Super Bowl. So all of these tactics, my team was saying, how do you know this stuff? I mean, and I said, you know, it's all part of my journey somewhere along the way. So there's lots of lessons in that chapter as well. You, you know, this is a, this just in because this isn't in the book, but it just triggered a thought in, in me that you just said, you know, I think so often you know, when we're on our journeys, we don't, we don't think about that where we're at is going to contribute to something in our future. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is if we could, if we could appreciate where we are at, even if you're not real happy with where you're at, that you could see it as being something that is going to contribute to something even greater. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it could make the, it could make it, I mean, because that's what you, that's what you just did. Absolutely. And, you, you, you know, as Steve it. Jobs always said, it's like the dots eventually connect. Right. And right. but when you're right. in it and you go through challenging times, you don't see it. I'll give you another example. That's not in the book when the pandemic hit the U S which, you know, I, I think about as last March and uh, it was, it, you know, it was a, really challenging time. I mean, we're an essential product. So unlike, you know, so many uh, other companies that were sharing with their employees to shelter in place and stay home, we were saying, actually, here's your gloves and your masks and your hand sanitizers, and you need to work. And I was not probably the favorite CEO of many. I even had em some employees of mine who are obviously very comfortable with me uh, saying, are you trying to kill me, right? I mean, it was, a, it was an incredibly challenging time as a leader. And, you know, what I knew to do based on my journey and sort of other experiences was in order to build trust, I needed to roll up my sleeves and jump in too. So I wasn't going to be the CEO who was going to sit inside of my home and watch this go on. I took on a route and I went out uh, with my team and, and made sure in Marin County where I live that not only were the store shelves stocked, but that my team saw me going out and, and people have asked me, why did you do that? Number one, I wanted to make sure that I was making the right decision and that my team was safe. But number two, because that is how I've, that, that is how I know for sure that it, it, that that's how you lead people into paths where maybe you don't exactly know how to manage a pandemic. No one did, but I, but the way to build trust with your team is actually to go in the pit with them, right? And be able to really see what's going on, not sitting in your, you know, glass castle. And then the other one that I do talk about in the book that was instrumental to me and in, in really sort of a next step to, to move forward is uh, in, in March, um, you know, we 
we needed capital. I mean, we had capital. We were growing like crazy. We we didn't know how long the pandemic was going to go on for. But in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis, I mean, that was an incredibly challenging time for so many, including us. And we didn't have enough money in the bank. And, and it was, I mean, we almost shut down. And so I remember that feeling. I definitely have looked back on that time and, and thought about it. And what could I have done differently? I could have had two years worth of capital in the bank, not knowing how to like weather the storm. So while it wasn't a pandemic, it was also a very challenging time. And so the first thing I did was go to my CFO and I said, we need to raise money. And he said, do you, do you realize that we're all sheltering in place and on Zoom? The majority of you know finance people, that's what they're doing. And I said, we cannot allow Zoom to be a hindrance right. for what we need to get done. We have to use it as a tool. And I don't know how exactly to do that yet, but we have to. And we have to teach people the people that we need to talk to in order to raise money, that that's all this is. And, and we did, we went out and raised two years worth of capital, growth capital. And again, I think that setting the company up properly, obviously, and having all of, you know, the, being able to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, that's mandatory, but also knowing how that these challenging times in the past will actually help you. Maybe they were there right. in order to teach you maybe those things, those challenging times that I thought were so hard. It was way harder to manage during a pandemic, <laughs> yet I felt like I had a, a clue, right? A hint, right? To be able to uh. say, this is, what I, this is what I need to do. And more than anything, what I learned in so many different instances is that complacency will kill you, oh, yeah. right? You have to keep moving and you have to figure out how do you move forward? And I mean, that's true during a pandemic too. You have to figure out, you cannot freeze. The companies one year later that did not innovate, that froze, that basically said, we can't do anything. Those are the ones that are really struggling today or are shut down. Right. And I think that that, again, so many lessons along the way where I really embrace my journey and I'm constantly going back and trying to relive those moments, especially the hard ones. You know, I, I tell my coaching clients, you know, that so frequently that, you know, I could teach them a lot of psychology and I could teach a lot of things and I could coach you through a lot of things. But the truth of the matter is I cannot teach you resilience, perseverance or patience. You have to live those. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that you just, again, just shared in here is that, you know, undaunted being undaunted, you, you can't, you, you could, if you did not have those previous experiences of where you had to raise money before, right. And that matter of fact, there was a point there where you had put up everything that you owned on the line, everything. You, 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 yeah. talk, you talked about how literally you, you could have lost it all, mm -hmm. right? And you did it anyway. It was quite the risk, but you, you don't learn that resilience. You don't learn perseverance. You don't learn persistence. You don't learn patience. You don't learn those things. I can't teach that to you. You can't, it's not a classroom that I can teach you, to put you in and teach you. You have to live that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, and I think, you know, when you're going, when we're going through it, it stinks. You know, I mean, it does. It, there's, there's no doubt. It, it stinks. But you just, you just demonstrated <laughs> that having gone through all that previously, now you come up against the next thing. You're, you may not know exactly how to prepare for it, but you're better prepared than you would had you not gone through it previously. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, knowing that bad things will happen along the way, but it's how do you, how do you weather those storms? What, how do you embrace those lessons? Another, you know, story from the book is the Starbucks story. You know, the Starbucks yes. story. And do you mind if I share that? Oh, go share. I'll tell you, what, let's do this. 
let's let's hold on. Let's do a quick break. Do a quick commercial sure. break, and then let's come back to the Starbucks story because the Starbucks story. Oh, you're going to want to listen to the Starbucks story because you're going to go happy, 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 joy, joy, and then you go what? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the teaser. I'll be. We'll be right back. You're listening to Kara Golden, author of Undaunted and CEO and founder of Hint right here on A New Direction. Hey, folks, listen, you know, I talk about epic physical therapy because they are my physical therapists. <laughs> I wish I could make that up, but it's true. And here's the thing. I know Heidi and Andrew who own the company and they're just two of the most sweetest, gracious, um, humble people I've ever met. And they care so much about your health and the people that walk through the door. It's amazing. And that's one of the reasons I do love Epic Physical Therapy is because they have such a human touch. And, you know, Kara Golden, um, you know, has said, you know, there's something very authentic and real when you can attach a human being and a human story to your company. And certainly Heidi and Andrew do that. And, you know, it, they are, it, the whole company, Epic Physical Therapy, is a reflection of their heart. And, you know, that's why their facility is the most advanced, top of the line. And then they have these trainers that are so comprehensive. They know the cutting edge treatments, but above all the else they care, just really care about you and care about getting you back to where you want to be. So listen, when you're ready for your epic relief, your epic results, your epic recovery, don't look any further. Go to Epic Physical Therapy. It's epicpt.com. It's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And Linda Craft and Team Realtors. Listen, Linda Craft has been around for a long time in the real estate world. And she started, she started when interest rates were 18%, right? Try doing real estate, try starting your real estate world when interest rates are 18%, right? It's a tough world, right? But she didn't understand that, you know what? She was going to make a relationship one at a time. She was going to make sure that she kept in touch with those relationships. And over the course of 35 years later, she still does. And, you know, that was how she built her business and how she continues to build her business is what she instills in her team that they understand that above anything else, we're going to care about our people. And we're going to care about the people who walk through the door. And that is the signature of who Linda Craft and her team is. When you walk through the door, yes, they are going to do the, because their experts are going to do the best that they can do for you to get your home sold or to find your next home. But the one thing that's going to come through either way is that they care about you. They care about what you care about. They know that if you're selling your home, those memories are important and powerful. So when you're ready to start your home journey, whichever journey that may be, start with Linda Craft at Team Realtors. It's real easy. Just go to lindacraft.com. It's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we're back here on A New Direction with Kara Golden and her awesome book, Undaunted. And we are about to get into the Starbucks story because here's, the, let me, I'm going to kind of set it up a little bit because everything is starting to move swimmingly well. And then, you know, Kara decides, gosh, what if we could get into Starbucks? And they had, at the time, they had 6,700 stores. Kara, take it from there. Yeah, so we uh, we ended up after a series of meetings getting into Starbucks. We thought we were so prepared. Uh, we asked the buyer if uh, what was success, right? And you know, they the buyer said, "Gosh, people don't usually ask us that question." And I said, "I just want to make sure that I understand." what happiness is, what's success for you. And they said, if you do a bottle and a half per store per day, then you're successful. Well, it took us about six months to get to that level. And then I was sitting very happy thinking, oh, we're killing it. We finally, after 18 months, got it to uh, just shy of three bottles per store per day. So I'm feeling extremely confident. And that's when we got the email from the new buyer who shared with us that it was a directive from the CEO's office that they were going to be removing our product from the case. <laughs> and I said, oh, you must have the wrong brand because we're killing it. I mean, this it's doing terrific. And she said, no, uh, I don't have the wrong brand. Uh, definitely talking about Hint. And we have your Blackberry Hint in the case. And we're going to put sandwiches in the case and food in the case and uh, higher margins, higher ring, 
totally, I mean, it was a logical move. It was uh, definitely in their best interests as long as those sandwiches sold, uh, but it wasn't a good thing for me. And I had six months of inventory in the warehouse that was going to go bad because I didn't have any place for it to go. So that is a story starting with the first lesson of don't put all your eggs in one basket. They were a huge chunk of my business that went away overnight. And uh, they gave us two weeks notice um, and that they were changing direction. And I, uh, I don't cry very often, but I cried that day. I thought, oh my God, how am I going to, where am I going to get rid of this product? How am I going to talk to my investors about it? I mean, we, we just thought this is it. We're going to shut down the company. Then I got an email from another Seattle company, Amazon, and Amazon reached out and the buyer, the first thing out of the buyer's mouth was I get a bottle of Blackberry Hint every morning with my latte from Starbucks. And I thought, do I share with him that we've been kicked out of Starbucks? <laughs> and I, I thought, well, he has an ass, so I won't share that. And he said, how quickly can I get a truckload of product from you the blackberry hint and i said you know we have an overrun of the blackberry hint and if you can wire the, me the money i can not only get you one truckload i can get you two truckloads of product he said terrific that really helps me out because i want to get this up as quickly as possible the net of it is is that we became one of the number one products in amazon grocery and i was thrilled right still didn't have my business from starbucks back but that's when a year into this relationship, I visited Seattle, went into the Amazon offices, and he shared with me something really interesting, that the person, that the consumer that was buying Hint was also buying things in other categories. And I said, like, what other categories? And he said, for example, diabetes monitors and uh, just other things that really sort of showed that this consumer is really looking to stay healthy or get healthy, unlike other beverages that we sell on the service that not so much, that they're buying things that really don't sort of equate to health or you know wanting to get healthier in some way. I said, that's terrific. Can I have the emails of the people uh, that your customers and my customers actually is what I said. And he said, they're not your customers. You wholesale the product to me and they become my customers. Mm. And that's when I, I said, uh, well, can you just give me the emails? He said, Jeff Bezos will never give you the emails. And I said, huh. And he said, does Starbucks give you the emails? Does Target give you the emails? Does Costco give you emails? And I said, no, but they're different. You're digital <laughs> there. And then I, I thought, Oh, if I would have just had the emails from Starbucks, then I could have told the customers where they could find the product, right? right? And it was at that moment when I realized that the only way for me to actually get that connection with the customer was to launch drinkhint.com. And so in the early days of launching drinkhint.com, I remember my investors saying to me, Amazon's going to kill you, like retailers aren't going to like it. But from my journey at AOL, I knew enough about, as I always say, enough to get me in trouble to basically know that there are some consumers who just want to buy from drinkhint.com versus Amazon versus some of these other services. And so we went ahead and launched a pretty bad website that was, it worked, but it was terrible. I share with entrepreneurs. I mean, we, it was, it was worse than any beginning Shopify site. It was bad and we built it. I mean, my husband and I like sat there on the weekend reading directions. We had no idea what we were doing and it worked and we proved out the concept. And what I, so I mention all of this because I go back to Starbucks and I thank Starbucks for putting us on this journey where I think that, you know, that Amazon buyer would not have picked up the phone. You never really know, but wouldn't have picked up the phone and reached out to me to put our product in Amazon if they wouldn't have seen it in Starbucks, right? I wouldn't have realized 
the connection that I was missing with the consumer, if it wasn't for that challenging, that failure, that bad situation at Starbucks, right? And then at the Amazon buyer reiterating, you know, a similar situation. We never got kicked out of Amazon, by the way, that was, you know, we're still in Amazon. Yep. But anyway, you're going to have points along the journey. You're going to, they eventually, the dots do connect. And I'm thankful for Starbucks for not only giving us the opportunity to be exposed to so many people across the US, but also making me recognize the value of data and, and having that connection with consumers. That was chapter 16, transform setback into opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what it was. She just basically gave you all of chapter 16, which is a beautiful chapter, by the way. So and, many more stories though along it's, the way. It's you such see. a it's such a beautiful chapter. I was about to say, I was about to do the quote that you have. There's a quote, there's a great several great quotes. You know, when you have the setback at Starbucks comment, you know, important to recognize the journey where it brought you, and you just did the whole quote and the whole thing. So <laughs> I won't even go. That's <laughs> I won't even go there because uh, it, it was that you just did chapter 16. I, I got to tell you something throughout the journey uh, that you went through from, you know, creating the product uh, to marketing the product and to learning about the product because, you know, I didn't even know what a co-packer was and, you know, who knew that this was a closure, not a cap. Um, you know, I mean, I, I mean, there, there is just such an amount of learning um, that takes place. But in chapter 21, which is entitled Face Your Fears, you have a quote, um, the more success you have at taking on your fears, the more confidence you gain to take on others. It's a virtuous cycle. And I have written about fear extensively in terms of, you know, the worst thing that can happen for you is to let fear freeze you. Mm -hmm. you you've got to go into it. Talk about fear and getting through fear. And, you know, even though it's a challenge, how you can maybe encourage folks to get through their fears if they're, you know, in this entrepreneurial or wanting to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think, first of all, we all have fears. And anyone who tells you that they don't have fears is lying, right? We, I mean, even the most uh, courageous people, resilient people, um, you know, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, they have them, right? The key right. thing is that they figured out how to get through them. And, and I think that what I've realized is that it doesn't all have to be in business or in, you know, your personal life, right? It all, it's, it's all about how many can you collect and how many challenging times where you've gotten through those fears. Because what I find is that when you put yourself intentionally into challenging situations, you'll get through them. You'll learn things about yourself. You'll learn that there will always be things that you didn't anticipate or predict. I have a story that I will not tell the whole story uh, in, in uh, the book around the Grand Canyon. I've had a huge fear of heights for my whole life. And I think that I purposely try and put uh, height situations into my life so that I can get through those and things get easier. Do they go away? No, not yet. But I know, it, I think it's not just about confidence. I really think it's something else that you touch on resilience, right? Mm -hmm. I think most people would describe me as incredibly resilient. And that is because I put myself into challenging times. And, and like I said, it doesn't always end up uh, perfect, right? And you learn things about yourself. I'm sure you've had challenging times where you learn things about yourself, but those, those things build character. They let you know that when you're up against something that is super challenging, you just have to figure it out. And you just have to figure out how not to stay complacent. And, you know, and again, it, it, it really is not just about saying this is my business life and this is my personal life. If you can't find them in your in your personal life, you have no challenges at all in your personal life, then go figure out what those challenges are. Find your find those dreams, find those stretch goals that seem totally out of the ordinary and know that they might be not achievable, but as long as you're on the road to get there, you're going to figure stuff out along the way and 
continue to learn from those things and probably be surprised at what you can endure. You're amazing. And we have, oh, been, we, we have been on for, uh, and, and by the way, there's people all over the world um, listening to CastBox FM, uh, Fatima, uh, Rosen, uh, all, all of you out there, Share FM, thank you. Uh, Maselli, thank you for, and everybody listening. Um, and also on Facebook Live, thank you, everybody out there who has just chimed in and uh, appreciate you. Judd Weisgold, you're awesome. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you listening in. Uh, so the show's called A New Direction because we try to help people find a new direction in their uh, career, their life, their business, or entrepreneur and success and leadership. If you could leave something to the listener from your experience, from this book, this outstanding book, Undaunted, if you could leave somebody, these people a new direction, what new direction would you leave them based on your book, Undaunted? I would say that nothing will your dreams will not come true if you don't start heading in one direction, right? It, and know that that trying is really, really the key. And and maybe you don't call it a dream. Maybe you think that you know there's a goal out there that I really re want to achieve. And try and shoot for something, right? Always be shooting for something. And again, be really, really focused on how do you continue moving forward? And it's okay to take small steps. It's okay to have challenges along the way. It's okay to do something that maybe your family doesn't think you should do or your neighbors or your colleagues or that everybody thinks you're a little crazy for doing. If, if you're going to do it for yourself and to go and learn, it's not a waste of time, right? It's a it's something that you need to do. And as I always share with people, it's your gift, right? You're gifted these things to, to go out and teach yourself how to be better. And if we are not constantly looking at how to better ourselves, then that's not living and that's not being human, right? And, and that is boredom. I think that's unhappiness, right? And so I, I cannot emphasize that enough. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you are simply, Thank you so much. You're, you're awesome. I, sometime I'm gonna, I, I don't know if you'd be willing to do it, but I'd love to have you back on the show sometime. Yeah, and, and talk let's do it. it you, you have been awesome and you've been helping so many people and um, wow. Just Kara, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Kara Golden, listen, what I tell you every week, right? Be inspired because when you're inspired, that means you can inspire others. And when they're inspired, that means they'll inspire other people that can make this world a beautiful place. I'm going to be back next week with another great guest, another great book. And it's going to be another great show. And as I say to you every week, ciao, every. <laughs>